Um, so go ahead, Frank, talk about how, when you guys ended up here on the estate. This is the Frank Frazetta estate, um, where Frank lived for 40 years. 40 years. So talk about Close when you to, came from Brooklyn. Well, first I want to say happy Mother's Day to everybody. Hope uh, everybody's quarantining. Yeah. We have a slight advantage here now that we're in the full state, so we're not really confined but we're confined to a beautiful area and you can see why my dad left it here. Um, we moved here in 1971. We moved from Brooklyn where my dad was born, myself and mom. You can't speak much louder than that. Anyway, uh, we moved here in 71. My dad, since I was a young boy, he always wanted his own estate, his own farm he spoke about, not with cattle or pigs just a place to go outside and have his privacy with his own little pond to fish and his ball field and it didn't look like this when we bought it I can tell you that it was, uh, it, was it was almost like a horror film the house was sold as being condemned on the 67 acre estate uh, I didn't want to move here I had guns and knives pointed at me in Brooklyn and, and school and I was more afraid when I came up here from the silence there was like a deafening silence from animals and things out in the woods in the swamp back here that used to scream at night. I had no clue what it was, but it's sometimes more, you're more afraid of the unknown. So we moved up here. This grass was uh, eight, ten feet tall with a lot of little barns and shacks. And uh, mom went with my dad and I to Sears and she wanted to buy a, dad wanted to buy a little mower. And the grass was like this tall. And my mom was like, what are you going to cut with that? And my dad's like, oh, it'll cut it. The salesman was trying to pitch it to my dad. And my dad was a little stingy with spending money on things that he wasn't interested in. So we took a ride to the Kubota dealer and they came out here with a demo Kubota tractor with about uh, 30 horsepower and a big brush cutter. And the guy dropped it down here and he just went that way. And this tall grass looked like this grass here when he was done. We were like astounded, like wow. We had our baseball field in a couple of days it seemed like. But over the years, my dad and I worked on the property. It was just us two cutting trees, this, this lake here was just a little pond in the corner. There were stone walls here, there were stone walls up to here. The museum was built in 2000, just behind us at the edge of the driveway. That was our stickball court, probably the most loved thing for my father and us to do together. Uh, we weren't hunters, we, we had guns to shoot, but we never wanted to kill animals. They're too beautiful to look at, but we had very competitive stickball games here. We had a, uh, an eight by 12 backstop and I remember how many days, and we introduced people to stickball, people in the Poconos had no clue what that was. So I walked in a, on a Sunday in my dad's studio, I said, Dad, we're playing stickball, but I'm sorry, I didn't know you were busy. He was in the middle of the Civil War, and he goes, I'll be right out. And I said, what about the painting? He goes, it'll be here when I get back. And it was, and he, he cleaned his brush off so fast, out the door, and he stayed and played with us till it got dark. He was pretty much the first one out and the last one to leave. His true love was baseball, stickball, softball. I mean, that was his life. He lived life to the fullest. It wasn't about art. Art was a way to make a living. You know, he put it off till the last minute. And you could see it in his art. And it flows. And it was never tight. It wasn't too dangerous. But that was a very special individual. That's what we missed. And we're not celebrating his passing today. If I told my dad we're celebrating his passing, he'd say, what are you celebrating it for? I'm not here. He goes, what's the fun in that? What we're doing is just giving you some insight to the wonderful career he had and the life that he lived and what who he really was. I mean, I wrote a book about him some years ago and gives you a little insight to my father. Um, he just loved to be here. I mean, it was just a beautiful place. We yeah. want to show you what the house looked like. This is what the house looked like when they bought it. That's one picture of it. 
And there's another picture with Frank Jr. inside the house. Shane, please, Ted, don't buy this, please. <laughs> this is a picture. This is a, a piece of art that Frank sketched out and watercolored because this is how he wanted to see the house. Now, Noel, show them what the house looks like now. And that's what the house looks like now. It looks like a little hot zone grill house, but the thing wanders. And all the way to the right towards the back, that was Dad's studio where he did most of his, well, all of his art from 71 on. And the museum was built in the year 2000, right next to the house. This is like feet away from their home. And that was done mainly because mom and mom was looking for homes and buildings in the area to put the museum. We already had two of them prior to this. But every place they found that they really liked, it looked like, well, if there's a fire, how are we going to save the yard? How are we going to save the fire department in the area? So they decided the best thing to do was to secure it, build a new one from scratch out of solid concrete, and, and there it stands. And uh, you can't get in it unless you have a backhoe. Anyway, it's a beautiful place. My dad designed the exterior, I designed the interior. Uh, looking at the lake, eventually we'd like to add on to the museum. Uh, we'd love to have a children's art academy one day, and that hopefully it'll come. But to look out here every morning to come out to the lake, just look around, and like dad used to, we always used to fight with neighbors on the island. <laughs> So this was known as the Frazetta Compound. If you could see, there's houses on the property. These were the children's houses. We were the only ones left here now. The other two homes that were the daughters, they sold out a long time ago, moved to Florida many, many, many years ago. Um, the estate house, um, William Frazetta caretakes that house um, so that he can maintain it and keep it running. Now, one more thing I'd like to say in appreciation to the fans. My dad was obviously a very gifted, talented artist. For many years to put down his talent and become who he was, but without you, the fans, who made him popular and famous over the years, he would just be an artist unknown. And your appreciation and love for what he's done made him who he is today, and he'll be, he'll be known for generations to come. And, uh, and helps us to keep this museum open because we could never do that without all, all of you. This museum is actually all of your museum. Um, it is all through your support. Ellie always said in the documentary, if you look, she said, this museum is not from her hard work, it's from all the people that supported and bought art and helped by purchasing prints and, and all the merchandise, and that's what helps keep this museum open. So we want to thank all of you for doing that, because we could never do that on our own, and this museum is very important. And we all hope that one day you all get to see it. So we're going to take you over to Frank's personal side. We don't want to concentrate so much on the art as we do um, Frank right now today. And if this works out, you know, we'll do more of these while we're quarantining. So we're going to take you to a personal section that we set up for Frank. If you can see the foyer, we do have people have donated some of their art that they did of Frank, which um, we have hanging in the foyer of the museum. This was done real quick here. This was done at our grand opening by an artist in appreciation for my dad as well. So I remember my dad, before he was famous, the fan letters he would get, and every day he'd get stacks of them. And he always appreciated it. He just wasn't more of an outgoing person. Mom was a businesswoman. She basically skyrocketed his career, even though it would have eventually gotten there, but mom really pushed it. So, we we'll walk over to the side. Oh, wait, she's going in. We have here in the foyer, we have some of Frank's awards that he had gotten through the years that we want people to see, as well as over here. 
some of his awards and his accomplishments. Um, like Frank Jr. said, the art didn't define who Frank Sr. was. Frank, the art didn't define him. He was not the art. He was more than that. He was a grandfather, a father, grandfather, husband. Um, let's take you to the personal section because this is really a wonderful thing to see. Frank, do you want to come talk about the portrait? We call this our portrait wall. So, Frank did these. Um, these were hanging in their personal possession in their home. Um, this was not in the museum when they built it because this was in their home until they passed away. This was Ellie's mother, Ellie of course, Frank, Frank's wife. Ellie's mother, her father, Frank and Ellie. This is Frank's mother, Frank Jr., his brother Billy, and then this is Ellie, which is such a beautiful, we found this picture, I didn't even realize Frank never referenced, but we did find this picture, um, and this is the, the picture that he used to reference this piece of art from, which is absolutely stunning. Okay, now we'll take you over to the personal section. Is this a lot better, guys? You can hear a lot better in here, right? Are there any questions coming in? Does anybody have any questions? So this is the personal section in the museum that we set up um, in dedication for Frank. Um, do you want to explain yeah. some of the objects, Frank? I tried to set this up a little bit like how that studio was. He, didn't have a, he had a studio in the back of the house. He wasn't off limits to the family or anybody who walked in. He actually liked people walking in to uh, distract him from the art because he was, art can get stale, even though he did most of the paintings in one night, one evening, he, he'd be glad to get away from it and come back to it and he'd be fresh and excited again and bash the rest of it out. But his studio was not that large, chair, his easel, his palette was over here. Uh, he always had a big jar of candy, mostly gummy candies, and lots of coffee. That was pretty much his, uh, his overnight stay to keep awake. Um, smoking, he didn't smoke, he didn't drink. It was just not a part of his life. But the uh, funny thing was, as I got older, I said, Dad, can I watch you paint one day? He goes, yeah, just quick, go make me a pot of coffee. Now, coffee back then was uh, Mr. Coffee. It would take like 15 minutes. So we'd sit down and get set up. I'd run in the kitchen 15 minutes later. I'd come back, and I swear to God, the blank canvas was already covered. Everything was already in the painting, and like an amber, like, like this picture right here. He'd start out with real diluted, he used oil paints and turpentine, diluted uh, burnt umber or whatever that is, or ocean. <laughs> bash it out, everything was in there, and then he'd use a little darker, a little black in it, and he'd get the shadows in. And I'd walk back 15 minutes later, it's like, Dad, what are you doing? He goes, well, I'm going to start the picture so you can watch it. It's like, it's already there. He goes, no, 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 sit down. I said, I wanted to see the, how it started, how it comes to life. He goes, well, sit down. I said, I, I said, it's done to me. I said, I don't want to see the little tedious, little defined work. That, that's not fun. I said, I wanted to see how the concept started from nothing. And I'd have to wait and wait, and it took me years <laughs> to say, Dad, let me videotape you, film, film it from start to finish. And he would never do it. But finally, he accepted, accepted, and I got the tripod ready. He was all set. I said, let's go, Pop, ready to go. He said, turn the camera off. I said, excuse me? He said, turn it off. I said, what do you mean turn it off? He goes, I'm not doing it. I said, what do you mean not doing it? Why not? I don't want anybody to know my secret. I said, what secret? There's no secret. You just do it. You, you project a picture on, on the canvas. You see it. I don't see it. And you just trace it, basically. You see? And he went through it. He said, ah. Oh. I was so depressed and bummed. I said, well, there's no, you can have the cameras back that you brought me with. I said, nah, you can have the top. That's the way he was. So, there was no secret to what he did. It was just, it was just a gift. And, and right. I mean, I saw him do it all the time, and I was amazed. I mean, I, I had to hold him belly laughs when I watched him draw. It just didn't seem humanly possible to see a blank paper with no eraser and sometimes not even lifting up the pencil. And like you just traced it, it, it didn't seem possible. But that's who he was. Okay, we have a couple questions. Um, in the, the picture of the portrait of Ellie, baby, who, who was she holding Frank in the picture that he used to reference? Well, that obviously was taken here. Uh, 
It couldn't have been uh, any of her children because it was too small. So maybe one of the grandchildren, I really don't know if I have a picture. Because Heidi was like five when we moved here. I think that's Brooklyn. That looks like Brooklyn. Well, if it's Brooklyn, then it's me. Yeah, I, I think cancer. that's Frank Jr. Um, I would say that's Frank Jr. That looks like in Brooklyn. That's not here. Oh, Long Island. Long yeah, Island. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So that would be you. That would be Frank Jr. Well, if the kid's uh, handsome, it's me. Uh -huh. So someone wants to know about golf, Frank. So show his golf clubs. These are the golf. He did play golf. These are the golf clubs he used. Yeah, over the years, Dad thought golf was a silly sport because his dad played. And he took it up in Brooklyn, like 1970. And he got hooked the first time out. I remember what, he went to a uh, pawn shop, picked up a set of Pedersen irons, aluminum shafts, not fit, custom fit, and he loved it. And my dad was just a basher. It wasn't about the score, it was about how far he could hit it. Then he moved, we moved up here, and I opened a golf shop in 1983, and I designed golf clubs. And they were called Crunch, and they were not only well-received by my, my 2,500 sets in a matter of eight years, which is pretty incredible in a small town. And my dad used them, and then when the stroke came in 95, that was pretty much the end of golf. He was, he was a blast to play with. It wasn't about scores, it was just about getting out there and enjoying yourself. Uh, and that was about the only time Frank left this property. He loved this property. And there's actually, we're sorry we couldn't show you today due to the wind. It's so windy out there, um, and it's cutting the connection. But there's a bike path that they built that goes from here over to all the houses. He would walk that bike path, camera around his neck. You would never see Frank without that camera around his neck. And he would strut down that bike path and he'd come to everybody's houses and he would take pictures of the grandchildren. Of course he had to get the best picture, which wasn't often because kids don't want to be models. Um, so not a lot were taken, but Everywhere he went, he had that camera around his neck. Um, people will ask me, I've been in the family for 40 years, and people will say, did you ever see Frank paint? I never, ever saw Frank paint, because as soon as I walk in the house with those children, he immediately get, got right down on the floor and started rolling around with them. Um, I never knew him as the artist, so um, when we took this responsibility of reopening this museum for everyone, I learned so much about Frank being the artist, and I have, I am, just like all of you, I am one of his biggest fans as well as all of you um, because I didn't know that of Frank. I only knew him as dad and grandpa. There's a really cute thing that I want you guys to see and Frank Jr. tells the stories really well and I never tell them. Um, it's hanging over here and Frank Jr. tells these stories so great. So come on over here to this wall. We set this up. There are numbers on all of these. We were going to put numbers on all of these sketches and we were going to tell, we were going to put the stories with them. But when Frank Jr. told them, we decided that it, it's better to hear stories because it adds so much to it. So, Frank, we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to start with a few of these pictures. These were things that happened to Frank in his real life. And he would sit down and sketch out these cute little montages of things that he that happened to him. So Frank, why don't you pick a few, point okay. to it so Noelle can can show people and then um, tell the stories behind it because they're okay. really cute. All right, first and foremost, my dad was an incredible athlete, which gave him a huge advantage in his art career as well. He knew what the limitations of the human body was and what, what was real, what was realistic, and what how he can make the unbelievable believable. But this is my dad, told me, he told me these stories a hundred different times. This is my dad taking, this is a, a, I guess they call them handball courts that are solid concrete walls and then stick ball yards and wherever it is in Brooklyn. And he could actually run and jump and take five steps on that wall. And the only other person I just saw do that was Bo Jackson. Um, uh, in, his, in his 20s, he was uh, down in the subway on the way to Manhattan and uh, somebody fell onto the train track. He wasn't sure if he just fell in there or wanted to commit suicide, but dad jumped over, threw him out over top when the train was coming. These are the stories I remember fondly. Um, dad here with the bees. Now up here, like I said, the grass is pretty tall. We knew of bees and trees growing up in Brooklyn, not in the ground, and we'd be mowing the grass out there and all of a sudden a hornet's nest. And that day, Dad had 77 stings and I had like 13. 
Well, I can tell you, my dad ran right past me. That's how, <laughs> that's how fast he was running. Uh, the home that we purchased was infested with bats. Uh, dad had a, I don't know if that was a chestnut cooker or an old bed heater of some sort. I know it was antique. And the bats would be buzzing around the house all night long. And sadly, we killed quite a few of them off, not knowing the, uh, the positives they had in the environment. But this was a funny story. Uh, Back in 71, right before we moved up here, kids were walking through our yard and saying things and getting really nasty to us. And Where was this from? This was in Brooklyn on 15th Street, uh, Avenue Z. This girl walked in the backyard and said, you can't come in our yard, go around the block. And my dad walked outside and she said something really nasty to my dad. And he goes, oh yeah? And she tried to climb over this fence. My dad instinctively reached back, grabbed an, an apple that was on the ground and hit her dead center, in that, as you can see in that picture. And she screamed and fell right over that fence and we laughed. I'm telling you, that was about 50 feet away and he, he always was very accurate with his, with his arm. Uh, the cyclone, that was where he said he separated the, the boys from the men and his friends. And he goes, his friends were scared to death to go on it because that was the big thing in Coney Island. Uh, baseball, that was his, his real passion. And then one time, at the Halloween, we were carving pumpkins, and my brother and I were making fun of my sister's carving. And then my dad walks in the room, she was crying. What's the matter? He goes, they're making fun of what I did. He goes, oh yeah. And then my dad did his beautiful carving of a pumpkin. And then she started laughing at us. But that's just the way my dad was, and it was all in good fun. He never took sides. If you did anything wrong, as long as you took responsibility for it, he was fine. He was a Sicilian background, and on occasion it would show up. But uh, I was very respectful of my dad. And we'll show you one more thing on the wall. Um, thank you, Frank. This is, um, we put this together because Frank loved Frank Sinatra. <coughs> loved, loved, loved Frank Sinatra. He'd sit and listen to these albums all the time, and he would sit and sketch Sinatra out. There's actually a story. Frank, what was that story you said he went to see Sinatra in New York yeah, in the went, nightclub? I, think, I don't know where it was, Carnegie Hall or somewhere, Radio City. He went there. Did a sketch of Sinatra and went right up to the stage and handed it to him. He said Sinatra nodded and that was it. So, but my dad loved it. I remember I was learning how to paint and I had Billy Idol on. And my dad, I'm, I'm sitting there painting all of a sudden, I get a slap in the back of my head. I said, What are you doing, Pop? He goes, What the heck are you listening to? Get that crap off, I'll get you some good music. And I said, Oh no, he's going to get Sinatra. And he came back a few minutes later with the Rite of Spring by Stravinsky. He goes, Now, Close your eyes, put this on, and listen to it, and things will come to you as far as imagination. And once I heard it, that was it. So. Um, someone asked a question about touring. Um, if we would um, ever tour into Europe or other places with the art. Um, we, this is the museum Frank and Ellie built right next to their home. We are limited with the art that we have. Um, so. We just don't want to take any art out of here. First of all, Frank didn't paint careful. Frank, do you have any stories about your dad with, Frank would do these paintings overnight. <laughs> and because he painted with oils, oils would take a really long time to dry. But because he would do them overnight, um, I remember Ellie telling me once she was always so angry at Frank because he would turn the oven on, he'd turn it off and he'd stick the painting in the oven to dry. Well, of course that then, is a quick drawing and creates cracking. So even if you took the best care with these paintings, we're so afraid of taking them off the wall because Frank didn't care if these paintings lasted hundreds of years. All he cared about was getting these paintings done and going to play stickball with his kids. So he didn't look at these paintings as lasting forever. And um, although, you know, we have a climate controlled environment in here. We just feel that if we take them off the walls and move them, we just don't want to risk the chance of damage. Most people do travel all over the world to see these, these paintings and we are limited with the amount that we have. So we feel that if we take any of these pieces out of here, the people that come to see um, these pieces won't get to see them. And um, so... Plus the paints that my dad used back in the 50s and 60s, didn't have the ingredients to deal with the elements, the hot, the cold, the humidity, like they do today. So if you get close to some of them, you can see some hairline cracking. And another reason why he didn't use varnish, he said the varnish would really bring the colors out and the contrast. But um, 
he said later it was yellow. Today everything's different, advanced. But uh, he said, Dad used to pile these before the museum. A few would be hanging on the wall in the house. The rest of them would be stacked in the closet and pull them out. There'd be scratches on them. None of them were in perfect condition. They never were. Nor did he have, he knew there was value to them, but, but not, he wasn't into material things like that. So it wasn't about that. So, yeah, he was carefree. I mean, his family and life was more important than the art. That was a way to make a living and keep his wife happy. So he was Are there any fond else. memories, Frank, growing up that you want to share, like that you remember that stick out in your mind with your father? Oh, the paintings? Oh, there's so many no, of them. Just, no, not with the paintings, just with your dad. Like, Well, I miss them dearly. I mean, I'd go over there every day, or if I didn't see him for two days, I'd get a phone call. He goes, what are you doing? Where you been? I said, I'm over here with the kids. He goes, why don't you come on over? He goes, I'm having problems with my television. I said, what'd you do now? Now, my dad was not mechanically inclined, mainly because he had no interest in it. So I'd go over there to his video camera when it first came out, and there's wires all over the place. And he goes, I don't have no picture. I said, Dad, what'd you do with these wires? Well, I, I stuck him in there. So this was after the stroke, so he wasn't as spot on. But I'd go over there, and he'd sit in the front, and I'd put the end to the end the out. And he goes, oh, you got the picture. And all of a sudden, I get the sound. He goes, how do you figure that stuff out? And he, he was very thankful for that, but that's, my dad had no interest in that. He just, yeah. right. life, life was so, very simple. So I will tell you that I will blame Frank for introducing my children to be the gamers that they are today, because when they were two or three years old, um, I remember Frank had, was it Genesis or Atari? And Atari the boys were only like two or three years old, and Frank would sit down <laughs> with them, and he taught them how to play Donkey Kong, was it? Or, um, and my boys today, I can't get them off the computer, they're big gamers, but um, that's the one thing that he did um, with, with my boys when they were little. Um, he loved playing. And cameras, he had, what, over 600 400, cameras? 400. 400 cameras. He had about 30 in here. He, he'd have duplicates. He was the easiest guy in the world to buy a present for. I mean, I used to walk in there. I, he'd always have stacks of photography magazines when the digital age started. You know, it started at like a half a megapixel. And if there's one coming out with three, he said, check this out. So I'd buy it, walk over on his birthday and have it around my neck. Yeah, happy birthday, Pop. I'd give him a big hug. And he'd look at me funny and he'd say, what's that? And I'd play dumb. I'd have that camera that he wanted. What's that? And I'd turn around. What are you talking about? I'd go, there, there. I said, what? what? On your neck. I said, oh, what's that? And he goes, come here. And I'd hand it to him and say, happy birthday, Dad. And he'd get the biggest smile on his face. For me, yeah. And I have a picture of him over here in the showcase I can show you. Of a camera. One thing I just told you. I gave it to him. And this is the reason what a nice gold like it. He just loved it. And he wouldn't even have to take pictures with it. He'd just sit there and click it and open it up and snap it, snap it with no filming and just have fun with it. If nobody came to visit him, he was over there either watching a baseball game on TV or playing around with the cameras. And he had so many like his. I don't think there's one he never had. All right, just, there's some questions. How many originals are in the museum? How many originals in the museum? Uh, as far as oil paintings, we have close to 40 oil paintings. As far as uh, watercolors, we have just, I think, the one or two long watercolors. We have a lot of pencils. I'm going to say over 100 for sure. We have more than that, but we have a lot of little ones. I don't know any real fancy, well-known ones, but a lot of the artist fans that come in here like to see the transition and the starting of how the painting began. Uh, but most of them are originals. We have a few uh, reproductions on the wall called the Master's Collection because of their well-known pieces. And they were split up after uh, the settlement. And I didn't get all the greatest paintings, but I had some of the best ones. It was my choices. Do That's you still play choice. baseball? Me? No. I wish I could. It wasn't baseball, it was more softball up here. Baseball, you have to have a, a better quality of players to play baseball. If not, batters are going to get beamed. Someone wants to know the Clint Eastwood story, Frank. So come over here story to where well. we have pictures in the museum. <laughs> well, the real story was my dad and I were in the studio. Uh, this was about 1978, let's see, 77. And uh, my sister yelled in the room to my dad, and he wasn't really approached by any well-known stars except for Arnold Schwarzenegger at that time. And my sister yelled in, Dad, Clint Eastwood's on the phone. My dad figured it was his friend Nick from uh, Nick. 
and they used to play a lot of pranks on my dad. And he just said, he goes, sure he is, tell him to call back. A week later, Dad, please was on the phone again. Figured it was a prank, said the same thing. Tell him to call back, I'm busy. A week later, another phone call. Dad, Clint Eastwood's on the phone. He goes, it's really, really important. He's got to talk to you. My dad said, okay, I'll be right there. And he made him wait like a half hour. And he picked up the phone. He goes, hello, Nick. And it happened to be Mr. Clint Eastwood. My dad apologized. came out here uh, to discuss the movie poster uh, for Gauntlet. And he was a really great, he was the closest thing to my dad's twin. Just a lot taller. Mannerisms, personality. Laid back, very, just laid back, easy going guy. It wasn't about fame or fortune. And just after that, George Lucas came here, Stallone, a lot of people. And it was funny to see the stars who came out to see my dad were more nervous meeting him than he was meeting them. It was kind of, it's kind of funny. Frank, someone wants, someone asked about um, digital art. What would your dad think today about the digital art? Uh, he would not think highly of it. Uh, I remember one time I was doing a painting of the outer space and I walked in the room with an airbrush. And he goes, what's that? I said, it's an airbrush. He goes, well, what are you going to do with that? I said, I'm going to just go one, one pop and I'm going to put all the stars in the background on one shot. He goes, you turn that damn thing off and unplug it before I break your fingers. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, anything you could do with that airbrush, I can do better. I said, I'm aware of that. He goes, you put your time in. He goes, he goes, that's cheating. He goes, how long is it going to take you to put some stars in? Ten minutes? Five minutes? He goes, turn it off. I don't ever see you with that. And that was it. As far as digital, the first thing about it, he would say, and I heard him say it before, and my mom, there's no value to the art. Something you do eventually gets printed out, and you have a print. So there's no value. Only unless you do one print. But uh, I think he might say, if you started it, just a quick outline of what you wanted to do digitally, and then enhance it by hand, maybe, but my dad wouldn't be into that. And he wouldn't have an understanding of that. He was born in 1928. This would be all sci-fi to my dad. You know, they did things the, the hard way. You know, you, you know it or you don't know it. Tim wants to know about his, did he have any formal art school training? At eight years old, he was enrolled in the Brooklyn Academy of Fine Arts. He was there until he was 16. And then he met uh, a comic artist who he studied under, not really studied under, he taught my dad the ropes of how to do comics, and the first comic he did was Snowman. And after that, he, uh, Roy Crinkle taught him a lot. So they, they hung out all the time, and he introduced my dad to the classical art and the classical painters like uh, St. John. My dad was always a fan of uh, Howard. Howard, is it? What's it? Well, my dad had a natural ability, but uh, he did some referencing uh, for his art, but uh, he just had it in his blood. Katie wants to know, how did he get into Edgar Rice Burroughs and start painting stuff for the books? Um, after he left Al Cap, who we worked for for 10 years, that was a comic strip over here. I'm not sure if this is Al Cap's book. He was making a ton of money. This is from the 50s, from 53 to 61. This would be a, one of these strips would be a daily, and two and a half would be a Sunday page. He was getting 100 for a daily, and two fifty for a Sunday. So he was making over seven hundred dollars a week in the fifties, which was unheard of. And he had a falling out in sixty-one with Al Cap, and he just went out on his own, figuring, ah, maybe I'll find jobs. Nobody would hire him. So basically, what he found out by emulating the same two or three characters for ten years, he actually forgot how to draw. So he had to go back to night school with his friend Roy Crinkle and do live studies to understand his anatomy, understanding back. So he got back on the ball, but he was still out of work for a year and a half, and Roy Crinkle got so far behind that he was working for Edgar Rice Burroughs doing Tarzans. My dad goes, why don't you give me some of the stuff you can't catch up on? He goes, and, you know, give me some of your work. So my dad started doing the little Tarzans. He was getting like $125 for him, and they retained the art. Not until a month later, my dad found out they were selling it for like three, four hundred. He demanded his art back, and then he cut his salary, but at least he got his art back. But that was his introduction to Edgar Rice Burroughs. And a little after that, Lancer called him in Ace Brooks and he was off and running from there. As everybody knows. George, how long, how are you? Um, how long did Frank work on the Catgirl painting for him? Here, let's come over by the Catgirl painting. <coughs> well, Catgirl was originally done for Jim Warren, I think in 67. Uh, there's two versions of it. Originally it was published as a blonde, more of a daylight scene, that's below 
the original. This is a reproduction. This is the finished art. I know he burnt, I'm gonna say, knowing my dad, two days maybe, the most. Now he spent, I'm gonna say, years, not years as in time, but he'd always fill with this, this uh, revised one. Uh, I remember I came home, he set it on the easel, blonde hair, my mom's cousin, Ken Kelly, who some of you know as an artist, his wife came with him and she was from France, she had long black hair, and my dad said, do me a favor, go stand next to my painting. And her long black hair, she stood next to this on the easel, and he said, thanks. And he reached out for his brush, black paint, and turned into a brunette just like that. He took a few cats out, he felt, it's, it's a beautiful painting, but it's a little busy, with what my dad's known for, the focal points, not where he'd like it to be, it's kind of all around with this one. There you go. And like everything else he's done, it's focal point, and then you almost have to force yourself to look elsewhere to see what else is in the painting. That's Nicholas wants to know if um, your dad ever watched Bob Ross. Yes, and believe it or not, he loved Bob Ross. I wish I had a video of my dad watching. He used to call me in a room and say, come here, check this guy out, he's great. I'm laughing, I'm like, what, are you kidding me? And he said, he goes, the only problem with this guy, he doesn't know when to stop. That's what he mean, he goes, watch. And my dad starts talking to the television, and I thought my dad was losing his mind. I said, he goes, okay, Bob, now put some reflection on the water. And Bob will start doing the water. Now he's going to go over the leaves on the tree with the raindrops. And he'll do the leaves. And he goes, now he's going to put another leaf in there. And he puts another leaf. I'm saying, what, did you see this one before, Pop? No, I just know how his routine is. And then he goes, problem with his, he just doesn't know what to stop. So about uh, 10 minutes into the painting, my dad goes, look, it's beautiful. Now he's going to overwork it, define everything, and it's going to look like a damn photograph. So he starts doing this, doing it. My dad starts yelling, like, what the hell's the matter with you, Bob? Stop, don't you know? And I'm just laughing. He goes, you ruined it. Say, he goes, if you want it to look like a photograph, take a photograph. Art is supposed to be your expression of what you're looking at and make it better if possible. But he did love Bob Ross. I don't know if Bob ever knew that. John wants to know Hi, John, who oh, were John. Frank's influences in terms of artists? Hal Foster, in Tarzan, uh, St. John. And after that, I don't, I don't think there's too many after that, but you know, he recognized, he, he actually looked at Jeff Jones. Jeff Jones, known as Catherine Jones. My dad said that Jeff painted a lot better than my dad. It's the actual painting. He had the old master style. He wasn't very good at drawing, but his, my dad used to be amazed at that. I just don't know how he does this. It's just beautiful. But he did love Jeff. Um, Bernie Wrightson. There's a lot of artists. I can go on. But uh, he wasn't afraid to tell an artist who walked in if they brought their portfolio that, you know, I can see my influence on you, but you're too much into me. He goes, there's only one me, do your own. And he'd be nice about it. And the guys would say, yeah, but when I bring my art in, nobody wants to hire me. They tell me they, they want it to look like yours. He goes, they said the same thing to me, but sooner or later, you got to break on your own. He goes, there's only one Frazetta. And he used to point to me. He goes, that's the next one. But that was just too damn much pressure for me. That's probably why I rebelled. Okay, Frank, Gary, hi Gary, wants Gary. to know if your dad ever worked with live models. He didn't want to use models because he said the painting would be limited to a pose. And you can see that in a lot of artists. I know he used my mom but on occasion, but it was mainly just for lighting. He used me once or twice when he had a commission job for L. Ron Hubbard, with, I think it was called a commander. It was a uh, colonel's jacket with like 20, 30 pockets, and he didn't know how they'd fold if he'd bent over, and things like that, but he, he said he would never use models just for that reason. Okay, Frank, Susan, hi Susan. Hi, Can Susan. you talk about the relationship with Ken Kelly? Well, there's a, there's a lot of stories I hear out there, and there's most of them are around. He worked at a gas station, and he was sick of coming to my dad's covered with grease, Wait, first you have to say, Eleanor, his wife Ellie, was a Kelly. Ellie Kelly, I don't know. But she was Eleanor <laughs> Kelly, so she was cousins with Ken Kelly. So that, okay, so now you go, so, so you know the okay, relationship. So, so he came over to the house and he said, can you teach me how to paint? And my dad goes, listen, I'll teach you, but it's 100% serious, don't waste my time. And Ken, my dad said, Ken came over every night for two years and just watched and watched. And my dad said he had more motivation than anybody had ever seen. He told me that 
I had more ability than Ken. He goes, but Ken had the motivation. I didn't have any motivation. See, I was like, eh, how I can't be competed. But anyway, Kenny, the first painting Ken brought into uh, Jim Warren, I remember my dad helping Kenny with the girl's face. And he brought it to Jim Warren. My dad went with Kenny. And as soon as Warren picked it up, he goes, and I won't use any obscenities, but he goes, there's no effing way that he painted that painting. And, my, and Kenny just went like this. And my dad goes, yeah, he did. He goes, don't bullshit me, Frank. And my dad goes, well, I helped him a little with the face. He goes, all right, all right. I go, come on. He goes, nobody does faces like that, just you. And But Kenny, Kenny was a hard worker, and he's as busy as ever. I mean, my dad... My dad and Ken got along fine. There was no animosity or any bad feelings or anything about anybody. Wasn't there a story behind Kiss the, um, that Ken did for the oh, album covers? Well, Ken tells me otherwise, but I was there when my dad was getting popular in the early 70s and Kiss approached my dad because he did a few other covers for bands. And they approached my dad doing Kiss and my dad, my dad was into, the, at that time, semi-retired when we moved up here. And mom did all the marketing and the books and she was making more money than she could make at the art. And my dad goes, I'm not going to do this silly stuff. He goes, Kenny, Kenny's getting started. Let Kenny do it. And he handed it off to Ken, and Kenny took care of it. He did a great job. That's what I know. And Kenny said otherwise to me, but you know, whatever. Julio. Hi, Julio. Hi, Julio. Of his um, era. Who era. Are his who are his favorite artists? The era. My dad's? Yeah. I mean, era of what era? Of his it? time. Of his time. Were there any of his time that uh, he liked? Well, St. John and, and, and uh, Foster. And his main inspiration in life, as far as art, he told me it was the original King Kong, who really got him going and had his imagination going, and uh, Frankenstein, he said, scared the hell out of him. Now, back then, he told me, because you didn't watch that on real TV, you had to go to movie theaters and uh, get a 50 foot Frankenstein. A little different as a boy. So. To my knowledge, I mean, he, he never spoke about many other artists. He was, he was talking about baseball. That's what we spoke about and did. Okay, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Hello, Jeff. What inspired him to create the Death Dealer? Here, show this one. Well, I've heard two different stories. This was the original one. This is a reproduction. Um, I heard, now this is the story I believe. When somebody said that Ian Ballantyne, who did a uh, fantastic art of Frank Frazetta, five different books, mentioned to my dad, do a painting, and I don't know why he'd tell my dad that, that's why I'm not sure of the story. He said, do your interpretation of death on the battlefield. That's one story, but the other story was, my dad was semi-retired, wasn't doing really any work, we were up here working on the land, and there were two critics out there blasting my dad all the time. Presenter's washed up, he hasn't done anything for years, it was a fluke, and his friends used to bring over the articles, and it never bothered my dad, but they just kept hounding my dad. And one day, I was talking to my dad, he goes, I'm finished with these guys, I'm gonna take care of them. I said, we're gonna go kick their butt? He goes, no. And what he did was, Civil Warrior, he painted, and this is right after he came out of semi-retirement, Civil Warrior and Death Dealer back to back within like a month of each other. And they were published, and those two critics soon after disappeared. Nothing about Frazetta, nothing derogatory. And that made him go away in the simplest way. And that's probably why my dad never spoke too highly of this painting, as great as it is, because this is the one that he's most well known for, other than the barbarian, the first barbarian. But I always loved this one. Frank, Fred wants to know, hi Fred. Hello Fred. Do you have a personal favorite? And when I was young I did, but not now. When you see him a few times a week up close, I mean, you can have one that you ultimately loved, but you can only look at that one I love it so much until you start favoring the one next to it or another one. I would say if I had to pick a couple, I'm going to say Night Stalker, as simplistic as that is. I always love the Huns, Death Dealer 3. I can keep going. People will ask <laughs> me the same question when, we, when they come into the museum. And what I say is, how do you have a favorite? I have favorite things about different pieces. <laughs> They're... Emotionally, um, if you know the story behind a lot of these paintings, they bind you. Um, just like um, we have, it amazes me that people will come in here and remember the exact moment in time when they were five years old and, and went in the corner store with their mother and 
saw the rack of comic books and begged their mother to give them five cents to buy that comic. But they remember that exact moment in time and that piece, that piece of art shaped and developed that person into wanting to be an artist. And that just amazes me. And so like I have, if it was a story about one of those pieces, um, that's my favorite of that piece, that particular piece. So I have favorite things about all the different pieces. So I have no favorites as well. How, my how dad, do you pick? Yeah, same thing. So I asked amazing. my dad when I used to have the membership club, and he said, I don't have any favorites. I love them all. But he did tell me which ones were the best paintings. He said that of the Conan paintings, Indomitable, he said, was by far the best artistic gem of all of them. And he said, that's why it's not replicated, because they, they can't do it. And as far as his personal, if he had a favorite, he said he'd favor this one. Uh, it's probably not the most popular out there because of the nudity. Um, probably next after that, obviously Death Dealer, but uh, Cat Girl he always fiddled with, and, and Rain of Wizardry here, which very people have never seen. Now this one he's worked on since the day he painted it, almost till the day he passed. He just fiddled around it, never touched the demonic creature in the middle of it, everything else on the side and the bottom. Uh, when I uh, took this through my inheritance, right at the bottom here there was a huge white circle the size of a grapefruit. And I, what the heck did that do to that? And thank God when I got home, so it must have been the gesso. I was getting ready to figure out to take it to some professional. If it's oil, and have to peel it off. But he was in the midst of revising something at the bottom, and that's why Mom didn't give him the keys to the museum after time, because he'd sneak in here and take one off the wall and put it, bring it in his room. He'd start revising it, changing it, and Mom would have a fit. Because after the strokes, he didn't have that same ability to, to tweak areas. Everything was softer. He kind of blotched the paint on. He didn't have a brush stroke any longer. But uh, that's a great painting too. The reason, guys, that this piece is on the easel in the personal section is that Ellie never allowed that piece to be in the museum. So this piece was never on display. Um, she was a religious woman, and it's the devil, and she thought it to be a little too pornographic. My son, when he was 15 years old, um, Frank said, William, come here. He said, do you think this painting's pornographic? And William stared at it for a while, and he goes, no, Grandpa, I get what you're trying to say. When the devil reigns, bad stuff happens. He said those women aren't enjoying it. They're in hell for what they did here. He said, exactly. Could you tell your grandmother so she lets me put it in the museum? Ellie never did allow it in the museum. That's why we have it on the muse on the easel out of respect for Ellie. Um, but it is an amazing piece, and we just think it needs to be seen. Um, we have another question, Frank. Um, so Dan wants to know if, hi, Dan palette of colors that he used or did he use well, that's a simple one I don't have to answer it I can show you I'll bring it. the palette's on display at the museum I'm going to put it in the light because without the light he needed now to my knowledge he, he had two palettes in his entire life this was the one of the used oil as a rock now, but he'd still get paint out of this. He'd work underneath there. But when you look at this, pretty good. You think the guy was a quack? I mean, there's colors on here. I mean, there's mishmash. But these, I'm guessing, were his base tones for the human flesh, because he told me a uh, woman's flesh has three or four hundred colors, and a male has four to five hundred. And these are all combinations that he used probably for the base colors to get the opacity to get different colors through it. Because I've been working with acrylics and they're terrible to do skin tones. Oils are a lot better except for the But that's it, I hope I can answer this. Okay, so put that back, Frank. We're gonna go over to Jordan. Hi, Jordan. A question about um, the store. Piece, but it's this, we have the comic book. It's called Neanderthals. Now, Neanderthals, Frank was given three to four months to do in the cover of this. Of course, he waited like he always did, Sunday night, morning. He put his kids to bed, his music on. 
paint, he had no canvas left. House trying to find anything to paint on. He ended up cutting the floorboards and under the wooden floorboards, underneath that was the raw masonite. He cut a little piece of that. Um, is it, are we back on? Mm -hmm. So he ended up, there's paint on that piece. We can't get too close because it's cutting a cell service out, but um, he ended up. Good. Paint on that piece into the piece of art. After that, he got a lot of attention for it, so he did many more pieces after that on Masonite. Not, Night Stalker is a good example of a Masonite piece as well. Who wants to know if you can get a close-up of his final Death Dealer painting? Hi, Tommy. How are you, Tommy? Um, final yeah. Death Dealer. The Death Dealer 3? Or, oh, the yeah. Death Dealer. So this is a left-handed piece. This piece is not signed, nor is it finished, because he was working on it before he passed away. So that one is called Death Dealer Number Seven. There are seven different Death Dealers. This is the seventh and the last one. You're back on. Okay. What other question? I'm trying to look. Okay. Why are you guys? <laughs> not standing. Uh, okay. Did your dad ever go to a lot of zoos? Zoos. 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 When he was a young boy, he used to take his bicycle to the Brooklyn Zoo, I never knew it existed, and just sit there in front of a Black Panther cage and stare at it, or, or pencil draw sketches that we have a few on the wall. Come over here, we'll show you. I don't know. Hopefully we won't lose it. getting away from losing it. Frank would sit outside of the cat cages and sit and sketch them. I wouldn't go down to uh, my cutout, but he used to sit and sketch pictures. Uh, yeah, images of ages seven to nine, he did those. And the one up here, he was nine years old when he did this panther as well. What's the story behind Swamp Demon? I don't know. You want to about that one? Originally, Swamp Demon was there was another painting underneath it. He did a picture of an elephant with a woman wrapped with a snake, and that was a gift for his wife, and eventually he painted the swamp demon over it, but I don't have that much information on it. I don't own the piece any longer, but that was, a, that was one of my favorites, too. Great painting. That's one of the few that he had a lot of varnish on. It really popped. Um, we're starting to lose reception. It's getting very windy out, so I'll take Wait, a couple hold more on, questions. Hold on. Um, Michael wants to know, are you guys doing anything to promote the art? Well, that's my wife's territory. She does the, uh, I guess, Facebook and all of the websites and facial media. I don't get into that. That's my wife's job, or what she loves to do. So, if you got any other ideas, I'll certainly take them. Brian wants to know, I'm not sure if that question was meant that way, but um, mm -hmm. Brian wants to know, did Frank ever have a relationship, friendship with Basil Gogo? Gorgo's Fingers. Mm -hmm. Oh, hi, David Spurlock. Um, David Spurlock. Oh, he said Wally. Williamson, Wallywood, and... Go Ghost. Go Ghost, yeah. Um, did Frank, Joseph, hi, Joseph. Did Frank ever meet or talk about Ray Harryhausen film oh, work? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Another wonderful artist in a different way did the animation, uh, but... Uh, I know he loved, I forget the guy's name, popping out of my head, did King Kong. Harry Housen was a genius. He loved him. Absolutely. How could you not? Talk about a long, tedious career of you know, stop motion. Very talented. Okay, Dave wants to know, did he ever meet Charles Knight? I don't think, I don't know who that is. Okay. Michael. He's rephrasing Hi, the question about the art. Oh, Frazetta being the ep epitome of fantasy genre. I, I can't see no Are you planning to... on doing anything to promote the arts in school of the Frazetta style? Like, oh shoot. In school? Yeah. It's already being promoted. I don't have the time for that. I mean, we're more concerned with just keeping the museum doors open, and it takes uh, a lot of money to do it because of the taxes and maintenance. But I know uh, the Tuber School teaches my dad's art. It's heavily influenced on the students, and when mom, mom was alive, they used to bring busloads of 
students here twice a month, and he'd come in here and sketch. And uh, he's taught around the country as it is, but I can't be exact on where besides Schubert. We eventually would, if we got into a position of expanding the museum, what we would like to do is um, have a three-part expansion, um, but that's going to take a lot of resources. But it is a, it's a dream of ours. The first expansion we would like to, um, we'd like to put on a, like a children's academy um, or an art kind of a, not even for children. Um, like 15 and under. But we would like to do a, a, a session where if you wanted to learn sculpting, we'd have a sculptor come out, a room that you could come and you could do a sculpt from start to finish or oil painting. If you liked oil painting, bring an oil painter in and from start to finish and on Sundays do a children's academy and, and, and do that for them. Um, the other one would be we would like to have a room where we could hang other people's art and do um, more classifications of art, different genres of art, you know, one month or two do um, sculptings or fantasy or oil painting or just to do different genres. We'd like to show other people's art. All right, somebody wants us to show the King Arthur picture. Prince Valiant? I'm not sure. King Arthur. He was how old? 16? That's Prince Valiant, if that's what you're talking about. 16 when he did that piece? Uh, 19. 19. 19 when he did that piece. If that's what uh -huh. you're talking about. Yeah. If you're talking about um, this one, I did that. <laughs> Will you go around and show a few of the fun mistakes in the art, like the reins on the polar bears? That was done deliberately. That was not a mistake. Um, were there any mistakes that... Well, like the, the, the uh, painting that he did called The Brain, and this is, again, he did it, and he knew it was a mistake. He, um, somebody with a, uh, I think it was a... Big horns coming out, and there was no way his arm would be able to come down. Things like, like that, I would say they were done deliberately, but he knew they were wrong, and it was just probably something to get a little response from some of the fan base. My dad knew, he said there's plenty of errors. I mean, his anatomy is wrong in some paintings, he knows it, but art's not supposed to be perfection. That's not what art is. Art is supposed to be expanding what is real, making the unbelievable believable on what she does. I mean, you see some artist drawings that you look at it and say, like, wow, it's, it's a little far out. My dad's are far out, but they're believable. But everybody has their own taste and own take on how to create something that they have an image in their head of, so. Todd wants to know, what's the story behind Vampirella? The story, that was uh, Jim Warren's creation to my knowledge. And it was supposed to be offered to another artist and he gave it to my dad. And my dad did the girl, he thought it was silly, he told me. And then it had such a huge response. It went, went I mean, the fans went crazy for it. My dad thought it was stupid. But like everything my dad does, it becomes successful. I don't know that much in depth about it, but I know that was the initial start with Warren. And he got along with Jim Warren as much as a lot of people don't believe he did. Damon wants to know, what are your thoughts on tattoos based on Frank's art? Well, I'm gonna put my, my opinion in. Sure. I think it's amazing that artists today have an outlet where they can um, get paid for their craft because being an artist is not the most lucrative. It's a very, um, it's, it's, a, it's a struggle for a lot of artists out there and I think it's great that they can be able to um, make money off of their craft. Unfortunately, I feel bad that they ha it has to walk out of their, <laughs> out of their parlor, but um, there's some great artists out there, tattoo artists that do amazing art of, of Frank's that I think they're spot on. And we've seen, we've had people come in where they did their whole, their whole back of the Silver Warrior. And amazing, I mean amazing. We had a guy walking Down here with a death dealer. My dad was in here at the time. He goes, Mr. Presenter, you mind if I show you something? He goes, sure. He takes off his shirt and shows him, and the guy was so proud of it. And he looks at my dad and goes, so what do you think? My dad goes, what are you, a nut? And the guy went, shh. <laughs> Frank didn't himself have any tattoos, but. And my, my dad didn't mean it as an insult. He just basically said, why the hell would you put that on your back? He goes, you can't see it. And that's how my dad Frank meant was it. not, yeah. But we think it's, we, think it's we, I've seen where they, um, the tattoo artists have collaged different pieces of art down 
um, someone's leg. And I thought they did an amazing job. They really kind of intertwined it, made it work. It was amazing. And I think it's great that um, it gives artists a chance to be able to um, their craft. What do you think the biggest myth about Frank is? Myth? Mm -hmm. I need some time to think about that answer. Myth. I think um, people, I think most people probably think of your father as being um, more movie star, more bigger than life. I think Ellie was a great businesswoman. She, I think, understood that it's best to keep Frank away from the public because I think their, per, their idea of Frank was this big burly guy who was bigger than life, like his art. And Frank, if you met him, Frank was a very down to earth, very, um, he was not starstruck. He thought that there are a lot of people out there with a lot of talent, but that doesn't make anybody better than anybody else, even though they had that talent. He was a very down to earth kind of guy. You would see him in Kmart or Walmart and you wouldn't even like think twice. You would point him out and say, oh wow, that's right. He was, he was just a regular kind of guy. He, um, he lived life the way most of us should. He didn't put his importance in material things. He just enjoyed the, the small things in life. The, you know, Thanksgivings, the holidays, a lot of food. He was real Italian, a lot of food. The grandchildren, the children, conversation around the table. And that was it for him. He didn't he didn't go out with, yeah. you know, wearing, a, you know, buying a lot of nice new clothing. He didn't drive a brand new car. He nice new cars. Um, in the 40 years I knew him, I only ever knew of him to have really one or two cars, and they weren't like brand new. But yeah, those were yeah. those things were not important to Frank. It was um, the mm -hmm. value Frank had was in um, unmonetary things. Yeah. So I think that that's what I think most people would be surprised about is that Frank he could have lived in a big a big beautiful home, but he chose this small little cabin that he revised and like Frank said, it was a Hansel and Gretel house, but it's what he loved. He loved this property, he loved the lake, he loved um, this small little cabin. Um, he just liked things that were real, um, the nature, birds. Um. I don't know, the only thing I can think of is they don't believe it took him one night to do most of his art. And he told me growing up, he had a lot of guys come over and believe him to sit down and watch him paint painting from start to finish in, in one evening. That'd be about the biggest mythical thing I could think out there. Or he used models or he used, he stole, he, he referenced the line he never did. Frank he had Daniel. Photographic memory, that's why I know that. Daniel wants, hi Daniel, wants to know um, was Frank aware of the work of Simon? Beasley. If so, what's your Aware opinion? Of him? What was his opinion? I guess I'm, you know, my dad didn't go out and read books. He wasn't around for the internet. Uh, Simon Beasley was a big fan of my dad's. Um, I think he was here at the grand opening. I think I believe he was. Um, so somebody brought a book. My dad didn't buy art books. I mean, if somebody introduced my dad to it, I mean, he'd know people that way. I mean, as he was a younger artist and went to a few conventions in New York City, I remember him meeting Bernie Wrightson. Yeah, but other than that, um, he, like I said, he didn't, he didn't dig into the art or go online to find other artists. It wasn't who he was. He had more fun than watching baseball. Okay. Um, Chaz, hey Chaz. Um, did Frank have actual worlds in his head like the timeless worlds of fire and <laughs> ice? And if so, did many of his paintings exist in the same world? Were they all separate, or do you think that he had this, was it one world that he had in his head, well, just bringing out different, yeah, or do you think? If there was anything in my dad's head, it was uh, baseball. That'd be his first priority, baseball, sports. Uh, art was art was there when it had to be there. It wasn't something you ponder or think about, oh, what am I gonna do this? It wasn't who he was. Um, I'm sure he had a world that was endless in his head, that's for sure. I mean, if you needed to come up with an idea, he certainly could. But this, that was not worth most in his, his imagination or mind. It was about living life and just enjoying it. That's it. Very simple. Not as simple a minute as you could ever get, but when it came to this, it was intense. Um, someone asked about the, the um, Boca Brown Museum. 
This is the museum the that Frank and the, the new one. This is the museum that Frank and Ellie built. It's next to their home. Um, the art was split four ways into the four children. Um, this is Frank Jr.'s. Um, this, this is Frank Jr.'s um, art. No, um, this is Frank Jr.'s collection. Um, the one in Boca Grande is another family member um, that they are going to be opening. Um, but um, so we are four separate entities, and we are the. Frizzetta Art Museum in Pennsylvania, and um, so is that, is, that, <laughs> is anything happening with the Death Dealer movie that was being developed? I know there was one. No, I know. There was never. There was always talk about that. I mean, Rob Regas had mentioned it, but no, it will never happen. Was was I doing? Um, I'm asking a couple more questions, and then we're going to get some others then. Okay, fun. Let's see if there's any more questions. When's the museum open and where are we located? We're in East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, just inside the Pennsylvania border from New Jersey, right off of Route 80. Uh, we'd open today, but we know that you know, we can't do it. As soon as the uh, pandemic is under control, we're probably still going to give it another week. I mean, we wish we could greet people now. I mean, it's open Thursday through Sunday, uh, 11 to 4. 10 to 4. When do we plan to reopen? As soon as, as, allowed, as, soon as the state grants us permission. We're still so, on lockdown. I think it's on, at this point they said June 4th, did they say? Yeah, they're thinking June 4th. Well, it'll be on the homepage of the, of the website if you, uh, when it's time. Were there ever any theft of Frank's paintings? Thefts? Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, yeah, 19, uh, his original Conan with the axe was stolen from the publisher in the 60s or early 70s. And sadly, King of the Golden Sea disappeared. But other than that, no, just two. Um, so are there any other questions about, we wanted to kind of keep it more on Frank, um, since it is his day of memory. Someone wants to see the full length painting of Ellie. Oh, isn't this beautiful? Yes. That is a beautiful piece. That is one of my favorite pieces. That's not available in a print, but if anybody ever wanted it, just give us a, a ring or an email and we can have anything made up custom for you. That's a beautiful piece. Um, someone wants to know if there's, if, is this the? Is the studio where Frank painted still intact? Yes. Set up. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and if you look at the house, it's it was the piece, it was an addition that was so put on, correct? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. It's still there, yeah. The yeah. house is still there. Yeah. The only difference is it doesn't smell like food when, I, when, when Grandma was alive. It always smelled tiny. Food. He loved good, he loved good. He definitely, that was one of his, one of his big things was nice one big. One more question. Um, did he do a Superman watercolor? He did for, for, for uh, a fan, I believe, he did a small one. My dad had never wanted to copy or do a commission or a job for anybody using somebody else's character. Yeah. That's what, that's not an artist. I mean, if it was his character, it's not a problem, but. So now with farewell, we'll go outside and. Okay, guys, well, thank you. If this worked out and you guys enjoyed it, we'll try and and do more with the paintings. Um, we'll, we'll concentrate a little bit more on the paintings next time. Um, if you guys enjoyed this, let us know. And if you want us to do more of these, we'll do more of these about you know, the, the inside of the museum. But we wanna thank you guys. We really wanted to just kind of um, you know, be a part of your life since we're all quarantined. And um, we just wanted to kind of um, remember Frank today on this day. And um, maybe all of you can Come someday to see this museum because it's it's amazing. And if you want to support us, you could go to the Fr Frank Frazetta or the Frazetta Art Museum or um, and buy something or just donate and or just come and see us, which would be great because this as great as this is seeing these originals on film when you see them up close, it is a treat. It is like it's magical. 
So we hope we can see all you guys. Let us know what you think. If you want us to do this again, we'll give it a try another time. And um, outside, when we get outside, the weather is just. Or maybe crazy. what we'll do is videotape outside. Frank wanted to take you guys on a tour outside where his dad would climb the the rock walls and stuff. So maybe what we'll do is videotape that and put it and post, and, it. And post it. Yeah, so you guys can see. Maybe we can do questions and answer from that. Yeah, we'll try that as well. So let us know what you guys think. Thank you um, for thanks a lot for videos. coming in, you guys. We really, it was our first time. Thanks for being patient with us because we were a little nervous about it. Um, have, he wasn't, I was. So you guys have a great day and um, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you guys. Take care. Bye-bye.